We're back. Welcome. Hey. Hey, everyone. Can hey, we... everybody. Hey, everybody. Marcos, the articulate. <laughs> hey, everybody. The absurdly articulate Marco Casanova. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is our third and last yes. part of the series um, in response to Dear Lana. Yeah, so this third um, podcast episode corresponds to the third blog written in response to Dear Lana, so that will be linked to the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you've already read the blog and it's been a few days or you haven't, I'm just going to briefly summarize sort of the main point of that blog, and then we'll get our discussion started. So um, in the blog written by Andrew Kamiski, who is here with us today. Um, he's Hello, sort of Andrew. Hello, Marco. Hello, daughter. <laughs> Hello, father. I don't know. It's weird to... I don't know. I don't know what to call you sometimes. Hi, dad. It feels like nepotism Daddy? if I call you dad. But... D-A-D-I no, with that's a so heart. Weird. Oh, my. I would never do that. That's so disturbing. <laughs> but I don't know what to say. I want to like maintain a veneer of professionalism. Hello, Andrew. It makes it seem like I'm like, I got this job in this podcast because of my dad. <laughs> Nepo baby. I'm the world's lamest <laughs> Nepo baby. You know, the world's worst nepotism. I know. Uh, it's the like, glamorous well, world of Desert Street. Wow, well, I'm so blessed. Yeah, yeah. You're so blessed. Blessed and highly favored. So, um, in this blog, sort of the, uh, my dad writes, sort of Simon's assertion of his thesis of his podcast is Alana's suicide was due uh, mainly for the self-hatred and shame she felt towards the same-sex attraction and how the church and its beliefs and its practice kind of worsened that to the point of she could no longer, you know, remain. And then the sort of central point of the blog, this third blog post, is, and I'll just quote from here that uh, my dad writes, I surmise that Alana's greatest challenge wasn't same-sex desires or an unloving church, but an irrational moral perfectionism, i.e. scrupulosity. Hmm. So I think to start, maybe Marco, if you could just define that term for us just a little more specifically so we all kind of have a good, robust understanding of what scrupulosity is. Yeah, so the word scrupulosity comes from a word that just means sharp rock, little sharp rock or pebble. So it's like something that's constantly just rubbing up against like your mind. And oh. it's usually in reference to to those who struggle with a heightened sensitivity to sin who maybe mistake and of course th these are catholic term not terms but mistake venial sin for mortal sin so mistake like l l in other words to put it simply little sins for huge sins that sever one's relationship with god or they mistake things that aren't sinful as sinful so that would be kind of a, a very simple definition of scrupulosity, a sensitive soul who's very aware that he or she is capable of sin, which is not a bad thing, but it goes to the extreme um, in which it, it, he or she starts to mistake that which is not sin as some of the most catastrophic sin that one could commit. So, right. And so scrupulosity is maybe a term used far more in the Catholic world that would apply to anyone, any yeah. religious person with that sensitive yeah. conscience. I mean, and for Catholics, um, there are saints who speak about it and who have come through it. So, you know, famous Ignatius <laughs> of Loyola or Alphonsus Liguori, they were known Very as Scroops, you know. Scroops, Scroops. But they okay, worked just, through They worked through it. Ecumenical so, podcast. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but, but, but to the Catholic point, so like saying if you struggle with scrupulosity, you can actually kind of heal through it, you know. It's, sure. it's not sort of like, oh, this is an immutable condition. Also, people would say that it's a, it's a subtype of OCD. Yeah. So maybe that's more of a common yeah. phrase for people to understand. Mm -hmm. And I would say in, in anchoring it in Alana's experience, what we know of her through this podcast is she was, if not the eldest child, she functioned as the eldest child of an extremely broken family, uh, a, a mother who was in safe houses, threatened by this this kind of out-of-control husband who lived elsewhere, Alana held it all together. She held it all together for the family, and her most obvious emotional experience was high anxiety all of the time, that my world is going to be threatened at any moment, and I hold it together by being hypervigilant, hyper-aware, by honestly by being perfect mm. so there was a family of origins dynamic here which is utterly obvious i'm not pay playing dime chair mm. or dime store psychologist here i'm just saying 
that was her profile. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that she had same-sex attraction, the way the three of us had, Amanda, Marco. Amanda Smith. We have Amanda Smith. Amanda Smith is here with us, which is so great. We're aware. That's a deep struggle. That's a deep awareness of, well, this disordered desire is deep in me. So to be aware of that and to be misinterpreting the very nature of having desire as being mortal sin, you know, this sword is dangling over me whenever I feel a desire for a good friend or something like that. That's a lot. Yeah. And so it gives me great empathy and heart for this woman yeah. and anyone who associates disordered desire for mortal sin mm-hmm. in the spirit of what you're saying. Yeah. So would you, is it fair to say that, you know, not painting a sort of broad with broad strokes but those who struggle with something like same-sex attraction in a christian environment where they recognize that it's sinful they may be more prone to fall into scrupulosity than someone with more sort of the pedestrian heterosexual desires perhaps Perhaps. yes i think because there's more shame uh you, you tend to be more isolated not to say anything about it because it's not normal you don't want to risk ostracization by sharing about it I think also some of the biblical references to homosexuality, if you take it too literally and too broadly, would suggest, wow, this is devastating. The impact of homosexuality at Sodom Mm -hmm. to the Romans, you know, it's a lot. (laughs) And so you you mistake that and, you, you know, maybe don't have the kinds of direction and formation that you need to, on the one hand, say, yeah, my homosexuality bespeaks disorder. Mm -hmm. I think we have to understand it like that as Catholics. There's something amiss in me when I'm aware of 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 having, you know, of of my same sex desires. So I offer that, etc. But I don't catastrophize it. And I think we have to be really careful about that with sensitive souls and especially those with a certain profile in personality and family of origins. So when, I, when I'm hearing, and tell me what you think of this, Andrew, but when, so you're, you're basi- what I'm hearing you say is that those who experience same-sex attraction have to accommodate a certain level of this is just going to be present in my life and I don't need to add so much weight to it. Am I hearing that correctly? Or yeah, I mean... How would you put that to somebody who experiences yeah. same-sex attraction is maybe quite allergic to the fact that they even struggle right. in this way? Right, I mean, I think there needs to be an accommodation to this is a tendency that I have. I'm not saying this is my birthright. This is, this is my biggest cross. I mean, I hope, I hope you have bigger crosses... Oh than that. <laughs> but but I think it is to say this is an inclination and I don't know long I don't know how long I'm gonna have to deal with it. So I'm just gonna keep being honest about what I've got to deal with and 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 seek as best I can to not add any kind of insult onto this this little injury <laughs> that I'm bearing. Yeah. Oh we we wanna kind of defer to our guest Amanda. Amanda fiery woman of God, great ambassador for the work that we do in Living Water. She's at Redeemer Church here in Kansas City. Pastoral care minister, right? Is that your title? Uh, Director of Outreach. Oh, Uh okay. Empress. Directress. Empress of (laughs) Westport. (laughs) It's good to have you here, Amanda. Uh Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, we just want to hear a little bit about your story and maybe how it intersects with some of the things we've mentioned thus far sure yeah this actually means a lot to me because um because of my story so when i when i came became a christian i had a really beautiful encounter with jesus um that was really radical and very transformational like right from the start and for five years i just you know i went from like this is who i am i am a lesbian that's what i really thought and then when jesus touched me it was like oh, that's not who I am. And in fact, I don't even want that anymore. For five years, I didn't want that anymore. I didn't, I didn't think of women in that way. And I thought it was a miracle, and I believe it was a miracle in that moment. So then five years into my walk with Jesus, all of a sudden, my friend started to look good to me. 
just to be honest. And your female I, friends. Yeah, I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm running, and, and these are like ministry friends. I was part of a church plant, and uh, I wanted to crawl under a rock. I, it was devastating to me. I felt like uh, God was far from me. I felt like I could not talk to him about it. I felt dirty and shameful. And it was uh, it was a huge trial for me. Yeah. Um, I did not know what to do about it. I didn't know how to get help. But I, it felt like a crisis of faith. Wow. And I wasn't sure if God wanted to be in this in a relationship with me anymore. Wow, because of wow. the shame. Yes. Did you feel was any part of you? We hear Alana's story, and I think she she definitely. I mean, what we can surmise from you know diaries and such that she felt similarly, but. There, I think eventually she kind of just said, you know what, this is who I am. I'm a lesbian. All of this battling against same-sex attraction is impossible and untenable. And, and so, dangerous. And dangerous. And yeah. so I'm going to embrace it. Was said that the clinicians around her. Sure. Mm-hmm. Was that ever in this crisis mm-hmm. for you? Was that something you experienced? Were you sort of tempted back into the old ways I, in this crisis? I mean, it was definitely it was definitely in my thoughts. It was de- definitely uh, a temptation of mine. But yeah. thankfully, yeah. God brought people into my life that were able to um, to help me learn that the Father loves me, even though I'm a sinner who still deals with temptations. Yeah. And that was a process for me. And honestly, that's the that's the reason that I am such a cheerleader of of Desert Stream Living Waters and why do living waters at my church um, is because we all need to learn um, that Jesus loves us, even though we still have this, this flesh in us that we hate it's, but it's still there. And, and we all have that no matter what it looks like. And I actually had to have walking partners that walked with me as I learned that. Um, But what a powerful lesson that is. Yeah. Wow. And, and how do you feel like community? Because I think some people could hear that. Maybe people prone to be the lone wolf and be like, oh, great. But can I just discern that God loves me on my own? What, why do other people need to come alongside me and walk this out? What, what, what do you think the particular impact was having others mediate God's love for you and not just your own private reflection? I realize God loves me and now I'm good again. Why, why were other people essential to mm. you being victorious? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I love how Andy says that, you know, we can't separate the head from the body. Wow. But for four years of my experience, it was just me and the Lord. Wow. For four years, and I struggled. And when I, when I talk about it, I describe it as a war against my soul. Wow. Mm-hmm. That I did not know if I was going to win or not. And I would say that wow. to people, I don't think I'm going to win this. And wow. so when the scriptures, you know, both in Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians, talks about these both... Um, both offices in the church and also gifts of the Holy Spirit, they all come through members of the body. So when you when you say it's just me and God, you're actually cutting off a lot, of, a lot of his graces that he gives through members. And that's just the way that God designed it. And I had to have that. And not only that, but because of some of my experiences as a child and the way that I interpreted my experiences and the meaning that I made of them, I had to learn that relationships then were safe for me. And so it was profoundly uh, supernaturally natural. So it was supernatural because the Holy Spirit inspired it, but it was profoundly relational, and that was really healing for me. Mm. Wow. I want to go to her church. I know. know. It's amazing. You'd be just the head pastor. Uh Do they allow it? You'd be my mommy. Neither do Catholics. We'll edit that out. (laughs) (laughs) We don't don't condone that in any way, shape, or form. Uh Absolutely not. We do not believe it. Never. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Did Amanda, did you struggle with scrupulosity? So in this period, uh, especially sort of, well, I'm a Christian. Now I have these struggles. Uh, was that something you fell into? Did you feel that a bit? I, I would say to to I would say to some extent, in the way that if I had the thought of a sin, whether it was same sex attraction or not, that was certainly the heaviest one. I, it would cut me off from God. Not that God was far. Sure. I would cut myself off from God because I felt like I was not clean enough to talk to Him well, or to come yeah. to Him. Um, it's really a, just a profound distortion of the gospel. <laughs> Um, so I do think to some certain extent, I I think where I lacked is that that obsessive part of it, 
maybe that wasn't as strong for me and I'm thankful for that. Um, but you know, I've been a Christian now. So that, that war against my soul, that was maybe around seven years ago. And, um, I, I, I was just talking about this last night. It's like, I know that I can run to the throne of grace now. Mm. And I know, um, yeah. and I, and I have the fear of God too. So it's yeah. like these, this, yeah. mm-hmm. this beautiful, so you run. absolutely. The fear makes me run not away, but towards. But too, cause he loves yeah. me and he's made a way for me. Right. Yeah. And, and I can always turn to him in, yeah. in times of help when I need grace, when I'm tempted and with any reality. And so learning the, the love of the father for me has been key to killing that, um, that kind of legalistic, I'm not good enough. I can't, um, I can't, I have to perform, 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 perform. Um, the love of the father just kills that. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. A practical. Cause I, I think sometimes we, we speak in abstractions or theology and it's like, okay, but I suffer with this. What do I do? It's like, well, read the prodigal, <laughs> you know, meditate on the story of the prodigal son. Like, put yourself as the prodigal and like imagine the father running to you in your deepest shame maybe like so just good. practically meditate on the father's love in that voice which is you're you're sinning don't come to god like will be lessened as his voice so i thank you for That's being good. a practical component i'm a practical yeah. person i yep. love practical components i think a way too that living wanders has helped i i relate to that amanda but as a catholic too just kind of <coughs> Um, struggling with the scrupulosity around my experience of same-sex attraction and sort of feeling a like, a, ah, like, why am I experiencing this right now? Living Wonders has helped me to read, read my, attra- like, what, what my need is, you mm-hmm. know? So whenever same-sex attraction comes up for me, it's like, okay, well, what am I, what am I desiring? What do I need? Do I need masculine, good masculine friendship? Like, do I need to go to the Eucharist do I need you know like just re, what what is my same-sex attraction sort of telling me right. in a way it, it seems like it's it's been important for me to understand that same-sex attraction has meaning and it's trying to show me something you right. know that I I don't I need not sort of beat my breast and oh my gosh I am damned but instead okay how do I respond accordingly it seems like that's what integration is it's how do I respond to this area of my life that is a disordered desire, but how can I respond in an ordered way? That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That yeah. So it really is looking at what is my relationship with my disordered desire. Mm-hmm. I have a relationship. I can think about it. I can feel something, but then I can think about it. Yeah. And I can make a decision about it. Right. And I can offer it to my self-awareness or to the Lord or to another person and say help me to make meaning of this right you know and I think in that way we all make meaning of our sexuality yeah um and and you know even in the ordered sense even ordered sexuality quote you know opposite gender stuff can be exaggerated it can be frozen you know, there's lots of different states of opposite sex. That you can be fearful of it. You, you, know, you can still be ashamed of it. You can be unduly motivated in acts of partiality, even seduction or something. And so the, the, the capacity to know yourself in your sexuality and your own different expression of it. Um, and, you know, to, to be able to have meaningful dialogue with two or three sources not not all the time but but at intervals yeah is i think important what we say in chapter two of uh living waters and we've said it from the beginning so in spite of all these revisions this has held true is um we define wholeness is how well do we deal with our brokenness yeah. meaning you're aware of what your brokenness is so you're aware of what your inclination is in in whatever skewed direction and then how are you dealing with it what kind of a relationship do you have with it um i think another way of putting it are you kind to yourself Mm -hmm. in your disorder right um rather than are you indulgent and self-justifying of dangerous and destructive behaviors in other words, I'm acting it out. I'm shucking my old false religious constraints, whether that's guilt-based 
you know, evangelicalism or Catholicism, and I'm just going to do what I want. Or is it like, I'm so bad. I'm mm. magnifying my feeling of badness because I kind of feel good about that <clears throat> because I feel like I should be self-punitive mm -hmm. because, you know, you can feel really good about feeling bad. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever it is, I think how well do you deal with your brokenness is a good definition of wholeness. And I think it's a great slug against um, the scrupulosity. Yeah, I love what you said about needing guides. I think it's so helpful because I think um, when I was growing up as a high schooler, you know, you go to these Catholic conferences and sort of the extent of it is it's not a sin to have same-sex attraction. It's a sin to act out on it. Okay, well, that's, yeah, thank you. But what, what, what's beneath that? I think, I think to your point, Andrew, it's like to be kind to yourself in the disorder, but I think there needs to be more than just that. Okay, it's not sin to have same-sex attraction. Okay, but what do I do with it? Yeah. I mean, I, I experience it, so how am I supposed to respond? Mm -hmm. Is it merely just getting over an allergy to having it? It <clears throat> seems like that's a prelude <laughs> to actually integrating this mm -hmm. experience. Like, how do, I, how do I walk this out? And I think this yeah. is where Living Waters has been so helpful for me in overcoming um, a residual scrupulosity and, mm -hmm. and being able to say, okay, well, what's... What's going on in me? Where where am I um, tempted or or inclined to go sideways in my desires? And how can I, uh, I mean, be chaste? How can I dignify myself and the other in in how I'm going to walk this out? Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, I've heard it described, or I've described it before as like a it's a, like a the the check engine light is on. So I don't, do all, you know, that, that thing goes on and all of a sudden you're like, it's like the worst, right? Don't you're you like, oh my gosh, the transmission is going to fall out. It's like, you think the worst, but it's like, oh no, it's just there to bring your attention to something. And with the Lord, it's like, hey, what do I need here? Well, how do I, um, what, what's happening with me right now? Not, and I don't have to despair the, or be in despair because of the lights on, but just, it's just there to get my attention. <laughs> I think that's helpful because I'm not a very scrupulous person, and when my check engine light goes on, I'm just like, just ignore it. Nope, nothing will happen. <laughs> you, you're like it's black marker. Minor, you're like minor, <laughs> not a big deal. And I'm like, oh, that's really helpful for right. those of us who are right. more li love denial and don't want right. to engage in that. Right. So, oh, what, why is my car on fire? That's <laughs> that has happened. My engine has burned up. I know, Katie. On I a know. highway. Oops. Father um, to daughter. Oh, no. But I do have a more serious. I, I don't want to work this out on the podcast. But I do have a question because <laughs> both what Mark and Andrew are saying it's lovely it's like you got to you know read your wound and know what to do with it you need to be kind to yourself but if I struggle with this which I don't but it's like well yeah. I'm always kind of assessing myself and I'm always trying to read it and so part of the problem is my incessant trying to yeah. read this or my incessant trying to understand am I being kind am I being too kind and so I think some people may suggest well then something like living waters or sort of repair to therapy would that, would that not worsen this sort of incessant self-reflection? So how would you respond mm. to that as a sort of well, retort th against what yeah, you Yeah, no, that's great, saying. Katie. And I, th I, do think, question. I do think any caregiver, and especially in Living Waters, these are lay caregivers. You know, even if you're a therapist or a pastor, you kind of have to put aside those roles and say, I'm just a wounded healer here to serve you for these next 20 weeks, whatever. I think we have to assess when somebody is scrupulous. You know, we do an interview process, like, so talk about your relationship with your, you know, your same-sex desires, you know, like, I hate them, I hate that I have this. Mm -hmm. eh. You know, when, when you see that kind of a relationship with the inclination, you're thinking, okay, that's a big deal. Then you throw in some mental illness, you throw in uh, bipolar, you throw in long-standing history of medications, mm -hmm. and you're aware, okay, well, this could be a real vulnerability for this person. Not that we're going to exacerbate it, but they're, they're bringing this in, right, and not right. everyone does. I mean, right. increasingly, I, I would say people come in shameless. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's more of the temptation Ignoring today. the check engine light. Yes. Yeah, just like, no, I'm, I, I'll do this, but I'm, I'm pretty hot on just gay identifying, mm -hmm. but I'll give this a go. Mm -hmm. That's what I think we see a little bit more than 
I am so bound up right. in, in, you know, centuries of religious guilt that I've inherited. Um, I, you know, so there's, I think there's different ways of, of that occurring. But, but I would say Katie and Living Waters, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we love Christian symbology. Um, and, you know, pity those who transfer a bunch of bad stuff on it. We love it because we believe that our imagination needs to be re-symbolized. So if you've taken all this bad stuff and this symbolizes this and that and the other, like we love the cross. We love the divine mercy. We love this image of this crystal stream flowing from father and son to us. So I think we help people. Hmm when they're in that place of awareness of oh i'm i'm this this feeling this inclination this potential threat uh is coming up again i think it's offering it to the lord in a meaningful way and kind of when we become aware of it focusing the eyes of our heart on something good and true and beautiful a good christian symbol that mediates something of grace to us <laughs> So I, I think there's a training, a yeah. pairing of an awareness of an inclination offered and then hopefully providing even good visuals at least once a week for people to say, look upon this as opposed to your own misery constantly. Mm. And, and I think we have to be retrained in that way. And there is clearly a visual dimension. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, you're, you're kind of the father of in this community, I do think that I mean, father in, of, uh, of 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 me. helping Misery. of Katie. Of Katie. You are the father. Oh, yeah, those you are the father. The engine light. The the DNA test came back, and you are the father. No, um, but I, can I tell a joke? One time, yeah. One time, my dad likes to like publicly, like in a Living Waters, like meaning but jokingly claim that I'm adopted or I'm, he's not my real dad. And, I don't find it particularly funny, but I, I, it doesn't no. it doesn't affect me at all. Like it's just kind of like oh, I don't want attention on me, but okay, whatever. And then one time, the sweetest, most earnest, lovely man came up to me after, and he he comes up to me and he's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "I, I think so." I'm like, yes. He's like, "What your dad said to you was so mean." <laughs> so he's like, "Are you sure you're okay?" And I'm like, "Yes." I am. The DNA test has come back, and I am yes. his daughter because I would not even think about that being offensive. But just <laughs> sorry. Remember that it was at the end yes, of a living of like, of, a, of like the last night, the banquet, the banquet like and celebratory. I was giving the closing talk, and he's like, "She's not my daughter." I said, <laughs> "Or she's." At the end of it, I said, "Katie, this is the time." <laughs> This person probably, I think he like tears in his eyes, like so concerned. And I was like, huh? And then I was like, this, this is this interaction is far more We've disturbing to me than that joke. So <laughs> We've reached the moment where so, you need to. <laughs> so sorry, that was apropos of nothing. But no, I was gonna say, I think Andrew, you've you've shown the community of, and what I meant by the community is pe people who experience same-sex attraction and who want to live chastity and I, I mean like this is like globally this is the hallmark of desert stream is being positioned under the divine mercy yes. you know <laughs> i mean this is why you're you're so immovable when it comes to i want to i'm when i speak i want the divine mercy there i want i want this jesus to be uh, at, at in eyesight for people who are very sh we're used to the shame yes. we're used to the the self accusation the accusation from outside ourselves so we need to be acclimatized to the mercy that helps us be kind towards our disorder yes so I appreciate that about living waters in a way I, I wish yeah I wish more people would experience that come to our training if you experience yes. that come yes. and experience a living waters group if you are in the grips of this scrupulosity thing I don't think living waters is gonna it's not dangerous for you in fact it's it, it'll help you yeah. it'll help you be kind to yourself it gives you the community that Amanda was yes speaking about yeah. yeah. And when Living Waters gets worked into a community the way it has so beautifully at Redeemer, uh, uh, then, then it, it becomes a part of the culture. Wow. Right. It becomes the culture of the church. Um, and so even in, a, in a, um, a Protestant or an evangelical setting, 
that may be at least historically iconoclastic, mm -hmm. you know, where there's like a stripping of symbols, like we don't want that, we don't want what could be a vestige of idolatry, you know. But but honestly, the the these great ministers of living waters that are evangelical or Pentecostal, they'll bring their cross in Amazing. and they'll bring a divine mercy in and then the pastor will kind of <laughs> come in the room and say, what's that? <laughs> When did you become Catholic? You know, it's like, oh, we're not, but we just want, we want to train our hearts yeah. toward what gives life. And there's a visual witness Amen. of mercy. Yeah. Uh, and whether it's a, it's, a, it's a cross without Christ on it, whether it's a cross with him on it, whether it's the divine mercy image, whatever the case might be, it's, it's not about the one symbol, but there's so many beautiful symbols of 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 the mercy that sets us free. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks everybody for thank being you. on with us. Yes. Amanda, this was great. especially Amanda. thank you. Amanda. Great to have you. It was yes. great to be here. Yes. Amanda is honor. wonderful. Yeah. She's the best. Yeah, it's a gift to have you. Thank you. Empress of Westport. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.